So uh, I'm Tim Bringlin, the, the chair of the committee, and um, if you all want to introduce yourselves for the record, we, we um, record each of our hearings, um, and uh, we've got about a half an hour with you folks, um, and you've provided the testimony, which I've seen uh, previously, course, yeah. and, and we've had this conversation before, but mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm glad that we are able to schedule you all to come in this morning so um, so welcome and if you could introduce yourselves for the record thank you well we appreciate it because we know it's a busy day and um, we appreciate the opportunity okay. I'm Lauren Glendavini and I'm the executive director of CCTV Center for Media and Democracy and a member of the Vermont Access Network uh, I'm Mike Wassenaar I'm the president and CEO of the Alliance for Community Media I'm based in Washington DC uh, I work with uh, access organizations around the country yeah. and uh, we have about 13 members of our organization there here in Vermont. Yeah. Uh, I'm Kevin Christopher. I am the director of Lake Champlain Access TV in Colchester and also the president of the Vermont Access Network. Great. And can I, just before we get started, um, just for my clarification because I'm somewhat new to this issue, um, so I live in the Upper Valley um, and we have a community access um, station in White River Junction. Are all of you affiliated, kind of, as a as a uh, industry association? And I, yeah, okay. It yeah. wasn't clear how how everybody was connected. So, so we have about four hundred member organizations. Okay. We're, we're a five hundred one c three. Yep. Um, with basically representation across the country. Okay. Um, and each state operates differently. Yep. Um, and then, like for example, the White River Junction facility, I think, is one of our members as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Kevin can speak. Yeah. And within Vermont, the Vermont Access Network is the membership organization for our 25 centers around the state, including CATV yep. in White River Junction. Um, so we represent all of uh, the PEG Access Centers in Vermont. Got it. Yeah. And we started this statewide association in the mid 80s hmm. when there were seven access centers in the state. Okay. So over that time, and we're going to speak to it, the state's regulatory um, authority to require public educational and government access has enabled us to grow this media ecosystem across the state. Yep. Good. So Thank I think, you. So I think Kevin's just going to start with an introduction on that. Yeah, um, uh, just if you if you don't know what we do uh, and uh, what that gentleman in the corner there is doing, um, we exist to, uh, we are PEG centers, public educational and government uh, access television centers. Uh, we exist to uh, not only give uh, the public the means uh, in, in uh, the form of equipment and training to produce their own content, but also um, to go out and cover those select board meetings, those city council meetings, those school board meetings, creating a link between residents and their local governments, uh, promoting government transparency. Uh, we also do a lot of work with our schools, our libraries, our parks department. We provide uh, video classes, uh, uh, training workshops, um, uh, library partnerships um, that provide training to, uh, to youth and adults. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, 25 of us across the state, um, which is a, a pretty robust ecosystem uh, in terms of the, the national picture. Um, and. Uh, we exist, uh, just very briefly, uh, thanks to the Cable Act of 1984, but um, the, the broad stroke is that our cable operators use our public rights of way uh, to run their lines to do their business, uh, and in exchange for that, there are certain uh, public benefits that they have to provide to uh, communities across Vermont and across the nation, and we are uh, one of those public benefits. And, uh, I think we believe probably the most vital of those public benefits uh, in a lot of neighborhoods. Um, and Lauren Glenn's going to talk a little bit about some challenges and some threats that are uh, that we're now facing that not only uh, could affect the future of access television in Vermont and across the country, but also really uh, are, are threats to municipalities and states' abilities to control those public rights of way and some, some de deregulation that we find is, is pretty alarming uh, across the country, and especially in Vermont where we value localism so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so once again, for those who just joined us, I'm Lauren Glendividian, the Executive Director of the Center for Media and Democracy in Burlington, um, and the founder of Public Access in Vermont. So 
as Kevin said, the um, 25 community media centers that operate 80 plus channels in the state of Vermont um, are greasing the wheels of democracy. So you're seeing your select words on those meetings, on those uh, channels. You are appearing in election forums. I'm not sure, I know some of you have been on election forums. We also supplement public education through our educational access channels. So we provide educational resources that public schools can't or are not able to for one reason or another. And we provide a free speech forum, which is, you know, we hold that truth to be self-evident, especially in Vermont, that um, more diverse ideas make for a more robust community. So we really are um, an important part of the fabric of the state. And the state of Vermont recognized this in, even before the federal government recognized this in 1984 when it required um, then Cox Cable to provide public access channels. It wasn't until later in 1984 that the federal government wrote the Cable Communications Act of 1984. So Vermont always, has always felt that this was an important public good, that in exchange, as Kevin said, for the use of the public rights of way, that channels and funds should be set aside for this public purpose. And the way that the state has achieved this public benefit for the past 35 years is through the Public Utility Commission, formerly known as the Public Service Board. And the Public Service Board has, in decision after decision, required the cable operators in the state. In the 1980s, there were 50 of them, if you can believe it, and now there are six, I think. Um, but that, as a condition of them doing business in Vermont, to provide these channels and to set aside revenue, which, of course, is passed on to cable subscribers. So the cable companies aren't actually paying anything. They are passing this on to cable subscribers. Um, for various reasons, over time, um, the cable industry has, has said that they feel that peg access, that's the short term that we use, is an important offering for their subscribers. But in reality, um, the dominant provider in Vermont, which at one time was Cox, and then it was Green Mountain Cable, and then it was Adelphia Cable, and now it's Comcast Cable, um, have, have um, more so than the smaller systems, um, have actively um, tried to make it as difficult as possible for the access centers to um, be part of the mainstream of the cable offering. So there are four or five um, issues that we wanted you to be aware of because the state's ability to um, require PEG access and to move this public benefit forward into the future is being compromised by these threats. And so the question that we want you to be aware of and thinking about is how is A, does the state still believe that this is an important public benefit? And if so, if the, our regulatory authority is being eroded in the ways I will describe, um, are there other ways that we can advance this? So that's really the question that we find to be pressing. Um, there are four or five things for you to be aware of. Um, the first is that there is just a general erosion of cable viewership, and, and that because people are cutting the cord, right? And it is um, more cost effective for them to choose the kinds of programming that they want, the a la carte option, uh, by going to the internet, which of course the cable operators are using the same public rights of way without any public conditions, public good conditions, to provide internet service to their customers. So that's just a, 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 an industry erosion of revenue, and we're aware of that, and that we have known this was going to happen since 1990. So this is just a slow decline in cable revenue. But that's not actually what we're talking about. That's not what's really threatening the state's um, regulatory authority. Um, Comcast was, um, was sought a renewal of their 11-year contract and two years ago, actually January 2017, the Public Utility Commission um, said you can continue doing business in Vermont, but there are a few things that you're going to have to do. Um, and that included um, making sure the public access channels could be found on the electronic program guide. Now this seems like kind of a funny, arcane, small thing, but actually public access channels are not listed on the program guides because of the, of the um, lack of upgrades that the cable industry has made in their plant. And um, they estimated that it would cost $3 million in order to upgrade these interactive program guides, which is really the heart and soul of the cable system. Um, and the Public Service Board at that time, the PUC now, said you have to spend this money and you need to, to move these access centers 
channels into the mainstream of where people who watch cable find their content. Um, Comcast felt so strongly that they shouldn't, didn't want to do this and they took the state to federal court. And for the past two years, this and four other issues have been an issue in a, in a federal um, court proceeding in front of Judge Crawford in Rutland. Um, I just want to say parenthetically that the cost for the access community to be involved in even the public service board docket at that time was $150,000. And the cost for us to be part of this federal case is estimated to be $150,000. So collectively, these are cable subscriber dollars. They're not being used to provide service. They're being used to litigate with the cable, the dominant cable operator. That's just a PS. So, so the federal court is one, one area. Michael is going to talk a little bit more about the FCC, but essentially the FCC, which is, you know, the... Um, the FCC right now could be a, considered a deregulatory FCC, and um, they essentially have proposed a rule that could go into effect this year, which would allow cable operators to subtract the cost of channels and other services from the dollars that are allocated for public access programming and content and operations. So this franchise fee that's collected on everybody's bill um, is one public benefit, and then there are these other public benefits like channels or um, additional franchise fees that other municipalities may collect, or um, even the cost of an HD channel. These are things that the FCC is inclined to have the cable operators subtract from the operator <coughs> in access. That could devastate White River Junction if that was the case. We don't know what value Comcast will put on those channels, but they've already indicated that they, if the FCC lets them do it, they will do that. So that could, that, so that's the, another threat. And then the, the, the final threat I just want you to be aware of is that um, on the Supreme Court, is a Supreme Court level threat. Um, and that has to do with a, you know, currently there's a case before the Supreme Court between two um, entities in New York State and the National Cable TV Association has weighed in on that case and basically um, tipped their hand and said, we don't want the Supreme Court in this case to say that, cable, that public access is unconstitutional, but the indication is that they will pursue that argument in subsequent cases. So there is the Supreme Court threat, there's the FCC threat, there's this, the federal um, court case here in Vermont, and then there is the general erosion of peg access. All of those things have our knickers in a twist. We are very concerned about those <laughs> questions um, because we think that they will affect the long-term viability of this very important service that Vermont holds, kind of takes for granted because it's been there for 35 years. Uh, just a quick question, Lauren Ellen, um, and we don't have to go deep into it because it's more probably more of a federal issue. I didn't even understand uh, the thumbnail sketch of what the what the Supreme Court case was about. So what? the thumb, well, Michael's going to talk a little. I, oh, okay, about I, I, I can right. speak okay. to that. <clears throat> yeah, I was. I just did a very quick drive-by. If, if, if I may, sir. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, basically, it was a dispute between a public access provider and the private operator of a channel in Manhattan, or and the question <clears throat> became whether or not the the First Amendment rights of that producer were being violated by having them censured and taken off the channel for a period of time. Um, the case went to federal court and was uh, adjudicated both in the district court and then in an appeals court. The appeals court found that the private operator of that channel was a state actor for the purposes of First Amendment jurisprudence. Um, and the, that nonprofit operator, similar to what happens here in Vermont, where the access management organizations are 501c3s, typically, I think, um, disputed the idea that they were a state body, that they were a state actor for the purposes of, of uh, First Amendment adjudication. Mm -hmm. uh, the Supreme Court took the appeal <clears throat> and I think uh, with the current status of the court, the majority of the court um, is very concerned about speech rights, uh, public speech rights on private property. There have actually been a series of cases mm -hmm. in terms of public fora, dicta, public fora uh, doctrine um, that have been popping up that the both federal courts as well as, as this current Supreme Court are, are concerned about. So the question at hand that NCTA brings up uh, is that <clears throat> the Supreme Court never uh, said that the 1984 Act uh, Cable Act was constitutional, that the channels themselves are the cable company's property 
they're a publisher like a newspaper, mm -hmm. and there's a taking going on in that the state of Vermont or any other state of the union <clears throat> that uh, requires a public set aside of channels for the, the governmental purpose or educational purpose or nonprofit purposes we're talking about these civic purposes um, that we value uh, is a is a taking rather than an exchange that's codified within the within the cable act and I, I think our organization just you know filed an amicus brief in this case we dispute the claim because there's an exchange of both money as well as 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 uh, capacity codified within the Cable Act, so it's not a taking, that the ability of a company to be able to use public property and public rights of way happens in an exchange, and a contract is formed between, in, in the state of Vermont, between the state and the, the company, rather than uh, an exaction that's been taken from the company at, at gunpoint. Uh, I, I, would, I think most people would say that that's not what happens when there's a negotiation that occurs between a, a public entity and a private private company. Yeah. So, um, so, so now that I've opened this box, yeah. um, I, I want to make, I make, I make sure that we spend our yeah. the majority of our last 12 minutes on kind of what's going on here and what we can affect um, as opposed to at the federal level, yeah. as interested as I am in that. but. Um, so uh, go, go ahead, Ron. No, I, I was going to go down that rabbit hole. Okay. <laughs> well, I want to, too, because I'm, I'm interested in it. But, it um, you, the, the, only, the only reason we bring this up is, but, is that it, there, may be an undue, there may be an undue circumstance yep. that affects all the communities in Vermont that benefit from, from these channels. So then the question at hand for communities across Vermont will be, how do you ensure that there's local information, local government information, local civic information that's available, that these information goods are available for the citizens of Vermont in, in what could be a very different world. So that, that is one of, uh, that, I think that was Lauren Glenn's intention for bringing that, that case up. And I think that once that Supreme Court case is over, it, there's an indication that the Campbell industry will bring up this question again. Yeah. I'm just wondering if we have any, if you have any data about viewership, about how many people uh, take advantage of the, of the, of the programming that's available on public access channels? We don't have uh, ready access to channel data. Uh, we all run our websites and we get our analytics there. Uh, we haven't yet done a good compilation of what those analytics look like uh, over a year's time, but that's on the to-do list. Well, and also, could I just say, we've never measured access by the typical Nielsen Mm -hmm. standard. We're not really seeking thousands of viewers for a program. What we find is that particular programs have uses for particular groups of people. So you'll find in the Essex Select Board, for example, on our YouTube numbers, that on a regular basis maybe 85 people will watch a live Essex Select Board meeting. But when there's gun control being discussed, you will have a thousand people watching. Mm -hmm. So that's what we really find is that it serves a purpose <coughs> for particular constituencies as a um, as a way of oh. well, even even that kind of data would be would so. Be and and for just a, a provide a just a very brief nationwide context, uh, the cable industry guards that data as a, as a industry secret, mm -hmm. and they will not share it with local <laughs> governments typically unless it's under seal. Um, however, uh, local governments as well as nonprofit organizations do uh, uh, in you know uh, contract with survey research firms to do scientific polling. In those cases, um, and there, so there hasn't been a significant uh, nationwide study, but you know, depending upon the community and the uses uh, of the channels, we find uh, that an individual program won't get high, high individual ratings. It's not like America's, you know, yeah. America's Got Talent, but the broad cumulative uh, use yeah. is high. Yeah. You know, 70 to 80 percent of cable subscribers in many communities actually use the channels or value them at some point and then support the idea of investing those channels with a cable fee. And, and I'll just quickly, uh, all of your programming is available to stream via the internet as well, I, I, I guess. I, it, it varies from access center to access center. Okay. Some of it's 24-7 uh, streams of the channels, some of it's on demand. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and a lot depends upon the technical capacity and the size of the, of the organization that's operating those channels. Um, so <coughs> very, very small operations where you may only have, like say, one staff member serving a serving a rural community, the, the technical limitations may, may, may pertain. Okay, thanks. So um, my understanding is that, that cable viewership overall is declining mm -hmm. um, as landline use is declining. And, and so I'm wondering if we need, 
is the system that we're operating in and trying to maintain archaic? And does this need to be totally rethought in terms of internet access rather than cable access? I think that's a key question that, that many states are grappling with, and it's a, unfortunately a question that the federal government is not able to deal with. And it's no small part because of sort of the, the inability of Washington to do things. Right? Mm -hmm. And so my editorial well, opinion there. Wide for it. <laughs> but I think you could probably gauge yeah. that on, on a, a whole host of issues. Um, since uh, a, a landmark decision that happened in 2005 regarding uh, internet regulation called the Brand X decision, we've, we've known this for, for 14 years, the same, you know, the same cable that goes into a household is not regulated in the same way if you're getting broadband on that cable. So the public property use is still the same. Some states do enable the ability to be able to uh, capture revenue, to be able to invest in public goods. Other states ban that practice for, broad, for broadband regulation. So it's really a case-by-case, state-by-state basis. And I'm not sure where Vermont is on this issue. And when you say capture revenue, would that be through something like the universal service charge? On yes, or uh, some type of some type of you know, equalized telecommunications tax. The thing that I think is, a, is useful to remember, while cable subscription is dwindling, broadband description on those same lines is rising. Mm -hmm. and, and video, yeah, and VoIP, right? And then that's going to be used as a, a base for <coughs> Wi-Fi use as well. So you'll see wireless use running on top of that. So the, it's an ecosystem of communication that will happen in communities, particularly in urban communities, less probably so in rural communities. Video use is what's driving the hunger that we have and for, for more broadband in America. So the irony is, is that while there is less cable subscription and the regulatory structure that you set up prior to 1984 still holds to invest in localism, all of the growth is not is, is does not support localism, right? And I think that's the policy challenge for a state like Vermont, where you value local information, uh, local democracy, uh, diversity of opinion, and 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 to be really blunt, um, there is not another mechanism right now at the federal level to be able to provide you with those local goods. It, it just will not come. Uh, and so I, I think this ends up being this sort of a question that, that communities across the country are grappling with as they see the, the need to be able to understand local issues, but the federal apparatus is, is broken. So there are a couple of things we've recommended, but I'm happy to defer. Uh, yeah, no, no. um, so the first is that... Um, That's uh, exactly we, my question. Yep. So we asked, and um, we're very happy that the Department of Public Services put in a request to the PUC for a workshop on these issues with the cable companies. Um, so that's number one. So I think that that is underway. Um, the second is that we are floating a, a study committee idea, um, proposal to uh, take this up and be able to discuss it in more depth because there are examples from other states and there are models for us to look at to um, restructure how this public benefit is funded and supported. So those are the two sort of roads that we're currently going on. So may I? Yes, please. So do you have language? I that? do. Yeah. I can start. send that to you. Yeah. Like Just finish what you yesterday. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Good. Thank you. Um, and then my, my uh, other question, um, besides do you have any specific recommendations, just uh, we're taking testimony on our omnibus um, tel telecom bill. Uh, the cable companies will be testifying immediately after you. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't because I haven't looked at it. So I realized today, actually yesterday, we needed to look at that. So we are. So, so on, on your uh, last comment in terms of some of the asks that you have, if you will, um, can you give us a sneak preview, if you will, on how this issue has been um, addressed in other states, maybe successfully or maybe with less efficacy? So some states are, are looking at, at uh, particularly enabling local communities to have, <coughs> have uh, what is essentially an equal fee for, on broadband. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, to be able to support <clears throat> uh, both content creation at the local level and digital literacy instruction. Uh, because very often one of the key questions that pops up 
is making sure that communities have the ability to be able to fully access the internet and take advantage of being a part of the internet economy. Right? <clears throat> and you need to have educational resources to be able to do that. So typically that's been, I mean, I think the key, the key example that I look at here is the state of Oregon, which um, has, has done that in a number of communities. That's actually something that the cable industry opposes, just to be clear. And can I just say, um, the reason so it's looked at in communities is because cable franchising is often municipal, not state level. Right. Mm. So. Vermont is an exception to the rule in that instance. Um, actually, that's not fair. There are about 25 states that are state franchises, 25 states that are non, that are local franchises across the country. I think the thing that's an exception to the rule is you're, you're, you're similar in, in, in many respects to the state of Hawaii in the fact that you're a, um, a smaller population state that's profoundly rural that cares about local communities. So the state it works at, in the in the interest of those communities in that cable franchising process. That's not the case in, in other states where state franchising reform happened something like 10 years ago. So that's the thing I think that's just to, just to be noted. Um, so you act like a local franchising state in terms of your interest in supporting local communities, but the state acts as a, a, in the interest of those local communities in the state franchising. I think so. So that question of how <clears throat> how video video a, a, and and broadband use uh, supports localism and local education needs is a key question that many states are looking at. Um, some states actually don't uh, ban those types of telecommunication taxes or because of um, recent um, state bills have have exempted uh, certain broadband providers from, from those. So many states don't have the ability to do that capture. But there's nothing in Vermont, I don't think, that prohibits that. I, I think um, a number of states are looking at um, making sure that uh, those channels can be seen by viewers. So this entire question of HD use uh, is popping up in a number of states. Um, actually, there's a state bill I think that's coming up and has just come up in Connecticut that asks that the channels themselves that the local communities benefit from are in HD. The thing that's curious is that that camera is an HD camera. You can't buy an SD camera in America anymore. They haven't been manufactured probably since, I don't know, probably since 2000. <coughs> Every TV that you buy in America is an HD TV. All TV use is HD use and yet transmission by the companies is in standard definition. So it, it provides a competitive disadvantage for local communities to have their programming seen. Yeah. And, and it's quite clear that, that, that that's a, a need that communities just simply want to change. Massachusetts as well has looked at legislation like that. Yeah. Last question, Robert. Um, in looking at, at the framework that you operate in, um, for clarity, my understanding is that, that uh, frequencies like television broadcast and, and telephone frequencies are considered to be public assets which the federal government auctions off the use of. Mm -hmm. But you t talk about cable access as a, pri as a private property. Correct. So that's a correct. fundamental difference in <coughs> that, the way that cable and other telecommunications are That's created. correct. And, and under federal law, they're, they're regulated under different titles of the Cable Act. But uh, that cable plant that goes to someone's home or business, that's a private pro private property that has to be a, a, that has to be allowed to almost have an easement to get onto someone else's mm -hmm. property, right, or to cross public rights of way. So that's right. That's the fundamental difference. We often talk about public airwaves as a euphemism mm -hmm. for the, for, me, for media, yeah. um, but it's not the case in in the cable uh, realm. That's private private property that's doing the transmission. Yeah, the, it's an interesting, I'll send you some information about that. There's, there are different, as you said, different titles under the 1934 Communications Act, and different silos, and all of these are treated like different. Mm. Um, they all have their public interest requirements, just like the phone, mm -hmm. the broadcast, the cable, the satellite, and um, that makes this a little more difficult to navigate. But for us, it's the Cable Communications Act of 84 is the controlling um, legislation. So we really appreciate your time. Yeah, no, thank you for thank joining you us. Thank you very much. Really um, appreciate it. I'll follow up with some, some uh, data for you and the you. Summer Study Committee and some background. Thank you very much. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks for finding us. <coughs> it was tough. Yeah, no. <laughs> We, we like our new digs. Maybe yeah, it's uh, a little bit more spacious than your <laughs> normal <laughs> room. So if you want to introduce yourself for the record and, and take it from there. Of course. Uh, for the record, Dylan Zwicky with Leonine Public Affairs. I'm here this morning on behalf of the New England Cable Telecommunications Association, or NECTA. Uh, NECTA is a five-state uh, regional trade association representing predominantly all private cable telecommunication co telecommunications companies in Vermont, uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Um, so I'm here this morning to uh, speak specifically on uh, the language in H94 and H145. Uh, I understand those have been rolled into a larger omnibus bill at this point, um, but uh, those are the two bills that address uh, the increase to the Universal Service Fund uh, from 2 to 2.5% two and, and the collection of USF on uh, prepaid tele telephone sales. Um, I'll get H145 right out of the way. Uh, NECTA does not have any concerns with the collection of USF uh, on pre prepaid uh, at retail locations. Um, it's not our business, so we have no position there. Yeah. Um, with respect to H94, uh, we certainly appreciate that the legislature uh, and administration have both identified broadband deployment and expansion as a top priority for uh, this session. Um, it's obviously not the first time that an increase to the Universal Service Fund has been proposed. Uh, since my time in the legislature, I think it's been on the table uh, each session. Um, so uh, just as a point of reference, NECTA and its member companies bring uh, more than $50 million per year into the Vermont economy between network upgrades and expansion, salaries and training, taxes, and, and, and uh, community investment. Um, we firmly believe that the decision about whether or not to increase the USF from 2 to 2.5% two, two uh, is a policy decision that should be made, made by the legislature. Uh, and so we, we are not going to make a recommendation for or against uh, the proposal that's on the, on the table. Um, we do feel like it's worthwhile to point out that the USF uh, is a consumer tax imposed on the consumers of uh, communications uh, service providers. Um, this increase will have an impact. Uh, on the uh, cost of living and uh, cost of business for uh, those in Vermont. Uh, the more voice lines uh, uh, a family or business have, the more that impact will, the greater that impact will be. Um, and we do think that the committee should consider an increase uh, or enhanced transparency uh, on how those USF funds are expended. Um, there's very little transparency at this point uh, or accountability as to how the USF, as fund, USF funds designated for high cost service actually go and where those funds are spent. Um, if the state collects a fee uh, on telecommunications uh, service customers in Vermont, I feel like there's um, a reasonable expectation that they that <coughs> have a, uh, an understanding of how those funds are spent. Um, and appreciate that the uh, intent is to really demonstrate that uh, broadband is a priority for uh, a policy priority for the state of Vermont, and so uh, perhaps the committee could, could consider uh, directing more of the USF dollars into the connectivity initiative so that uh, those dollars are spent on increased broadband service. Um, and then finally, we uh, do feel like the USF funds uh, should go to infrastructure rather than uh, personnel costs, and that guarantees that there's a cl clear return on investment for those funds. Right. Um, I just want to be clear. If, you know, I think initially you referred to um, USF as a tax on consumers, and the later you referred to it as a fee. Um, for what it's worth, I look at it as a fee. Um, for but sure. we're, we're, we're kind of hedging around nomenclature here. Laura, do you have a question? Uh, can you tell us how much uh, USF, how, uh, your companies, the companies, the cable companies, pay on a basis? Uh, well, so the cable companies will pay nothing because it's assessed on the customer, um, and I don't have that information. How much, your, how much the customers pay? I don't and have I'm that number, services. but I can get that to you. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'd be really interested in that as well, um, just, you know, where that stream is. That the, um, the revenue going into that fund in recent years has been steadily declining, and um, there are various reasons for that. But. And may I follow? Yeah, sure. So I, um, if you can, I would particularly be interested in that 
um, I know Representative Chestnut Tangerman has been interested in, and I am also interested in understanding the possibility, I believe, um, in uh, the USF um, being applied for um, internet. It seems like most tele telecom providers are paying into the USF, and only some are not paying into it. And um, we're kind of all moving into the same type of services here, um, accessing. so with different technologies and it just kind of grappling with that whole question. So understanding what, um, if any, cable um, uh, cable offerings, your <coughs> company's <coughs> offerings are being assessed the USF would be helpful. I'm presuming that would only be on VoIP currently. I believe so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although I, my understanding is that that's also the VoIP um, decision in the state of Vermont is currently being litigated. Yes. So I'm not really clear on uh, what the local access TV folks are talking about as far as were they talking about another fee of some sort on uh, cable providers to supplement that program? Was it, am I correct in assuming that? Or? No. Well, I can lay it out how I see it, but sure. maybe, maybe, it, maybe uh, Dylan's more of an expert than... Right, I'd just like to ask what your thoughts are on that. Uh, I think their, uh, my understanding is that their ask was for a study committee and then also, um, well, that was one of their asks. I'm forgetting off the top of my head what the other one was. It's my notes. I think generally um, speaking, that there's concern as to how um, the cable industry broadly is accounting for what they do and how it supports community access. And I think historically that has been a um, that has been uh, uh, an accounting function that has led to literally money supporting. And now I think the cable industry um, is taking a position that some of the things that they do um, are in fact in-kind support for, um, for community access, generally speaking, and that that should be taken into consideration as they support community access. So it's no longer simply just a transfer of funds. It's, you know, we do these other things that support as well, and those should be taken into account. And I think where the community access is concerned is, you know, suddenly their budgets, which are largely supported by cable folks, um, are, are shrinking because, of, you know. So I, I think that's essentially the, the monetary <coughs> issue. Yeah. And, Red, and, Mike, it's, and Red. it's true, I believe, that there's a, uh, a fee assessed on cable TV to help fund that uh, at what, 5% of I don't know. office or something to that effect? It's roughly $8 million a year in Vermont. $8 million a year. That the cable companies provide to the is community that, access channels in addition is, to the in-kind support. Is that the latest? Uh, I think that's within the last year or two, yeah. is what I understand. And historically, has it been higher? I could get you those numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm presuming it has just because yeah. of the trajectory of you know, where some of those revenues are going. But I'm sorry. Um, Dylan, I don't know if you can answer this or not, um, but it's it's a question about the, uh, not the not the high cost mm -hmm. fund, but the connectivity initiatives yes. and priorizati prioritization of that money. Um, and does, do, you, do your members have a, a position on whether that should be directed to unserved or underserved areas, or um, upgrading, you know, <coughs> or going from 10 to 25, you know, 10 1 to 25 3, or even wireless infill in, in metropolitan areas such as they are in Vermont. Um, but, you know, the, the, there are a lot of options on how to spend that money. And does, do your members have a priority on how that money should be spent? Sure. Uh, you know, our belief is that the, the USF dollars uh, should be spent uh, first and foremost on areas that are unserved currently. Uh, and then the next tier would be underserved. Um, certainly some of the stories uh, that I've heard in this committee uh, over the last several, re several weeks really address uh, those reminders that have no connectivity today. Um, and so if there are additional investments that are being made in broadband expansion uh, and connectivity, it should go to um, those individuals who need it 
and have nothing today. Uh, and then you can prioritize from there. Uh, I will say, without getting too much into the, some of the other proposals that are uh, on the table that are included in the omnibus bill at this point, uh, that has been the model in states like New Hampshire and Massachusetts that have, uh, and actually here um, under Governor Shumlin's administration, um, that focus on the unserved areas in Massachusetts uh, through the Mass Broadband Institute. Uh, they went from 44 communities to uh, that were totally unserved to uh, 10 communities uh, today in a, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and the, Mass, the New Hampshire model for municipal bonding that uh, you're looking at a version of uh, here uh, did focus exclusively on uh, on surf. And was um, no okay. sure. follow up and but that is uh, agnostic as a for the medium. I mean, it can be service can be copper, fiber, cable. Um. Service should provide at least the FCC definition of twenty five by three. You should not be investing in networks that are providing less than that. <laughs> and, and kind of a follow-up on this, um, and I don't expect you to have this today, but I, I would love it if, if, if it's information you have. Um, considering, um, you know, the high cost um, portion of, of the connectivity fund or the connectivity initiative, uh, I'm certainly technology agnostic <coughs> as to who uses those funds as long as they're used well. Are there cable companies uh, that have availed themselves of those funds in Vermont, and to what extent? I don't believe that next member companies have, but I can't say for sure, so I can get you know, okay. yeah, Whether it's high cost or um, connectivity initiative. Yeah. So I'd be interested in that. I will get that information. The question I've got is, you had mentioned um, not using the USF package. funds for yeah. personnel. Mm -hmm. what, in what regard, what are we talking there as far as administration? Uh, that's correct. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Right. Does that um, that same <coughs> priority or use of funds on on hardware mm -hmm. uh, would that also preclude um, feasibility studies, engineering studies, things like that? Or we feel like the USF fund should be used for, for hard infrastructure. Yeah. Thank you. But certainly appreciate the you know, committee discussion around mm -hmm. uh, the need for feasibility studies. So in Mass, uh, the Mass Broadband um, Initiative that's been out there that has been pretty successful, how many um, companies outside of uh, the cable companies have participated in that um, in solving that problem with the public dollars that were made available? Uh, are you looking for a specific number or whether or not there are companies outside? Uh, I think both. Right. So, I mean, first, are there any other outside of yes, the cable? Um, and then I think a breakdown. Uh, I'd just be interested in understanding that. It seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that that initiative has effectively served to um, use public dollars to um, offset the cost for private companies who are asking not to be regulated uh, to build out their networks to the last mile. Um, do we think that that is an unfair or a fair characterization? So what I know about it is it's been predominantly, um, those funds have predominantly gone to cable companies um, to build out their networks to the last mile, places that were not profitable for them to build out to. So, and again, I'm technology agnostic too as to how we get to that last mile, mm -hmm. but when we think about public funds, when we think about regulation, um, and the um, seeming incompatibility of those two things when it comes to um, private companies that they're, you know, we want our cake and eat it too. Um, I'm just kind of interested in, um, in the breakdown. So if it's been, what, what that breakdown has been in mass. So, so uh, to answer the first part of your question, yes, there are other companies in addition to the um, traditional cable companies that have taken advantage of that program. Um, it is a public-private private partnership that brings uh, industry to the table so that those addresses that might not otherwise be served mm -hmm. uh, get that service. Um, and I can get you a number on uh, 
I can look to get your number on this, uh, other companies that have engaged in that. And do you think that states have the right to um, regulate those dollars that are used by the private companies to get to the last mile? Uh, I think I'm wading into legal territory if I were to answer that question, so I'm not an attorney and can't comment. All right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to meet with the Vita folks and uh, um, ACCD at 10:15. For the record, Joe Bradley, CEO of Vita, okay. and I have with me uh, Cassie Palimus, who is going to be the new CEO of Vita <laughs> on April 1st. April 1st. First. Oh, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Our so, condolences. And, <laughs> and thank you. Well, you. Most welcome. It's been an unbelievable. You've done an amazing job. Thank so. you. Thank you. Um, so so um, I think we've invited you here today um, to speak specifically to the, you know, for lack of a better term, we'll call it our omnibus broadband bill, okay. which is sure. a combination of a number of different initiatives um, uh, that we've pulled together. Very specifically, um, I think the committee is um, interested in hearing your feedback and um, thoughts on. Uh, some of the funding mechanisms in here. Um, we have a section that deals with um, VITA funding um, for broadband initiatives. Um, uh, there's also some language in here that specifically relates to ACCD um, work uh, in, in terms of a new uh, funding program. Um, and we're interested in all feedback on geo bonding. I don't know if that's outside of your, um, <laughs> but if you have opinions, we're interested in those uh, on that yeah, as well. I but certainly think that, as you know, Beth is definitely the best one. Yeah, to yeah. Speak and we, we about spoke that. with uh, yes. the treasurer yesterday. Yes. So, but, I hope she's um, feeling better. My goodness. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, she was definitely doing yeoman's duty uh, <laughs> coming in, uh, not 100%. So. But at any rate, um, welcome. Um, thank you, thank so you for joining us, and, and we welcome your, your thoughts, actually on any of this, but you know, specifically there sure. are um, things here that relate to your, your day job. So. Okay. Um, then let's skip the about Vita. The reason I did that was because I wasn't sure how many of you really knew really what we do, how yeah. we fund ourselves, that kind of thing. I, so I would I'm welcome happy. a couple minutes on that. Okay. I, I, yep, th this committee, um, you know, the nine of us, uh, six of us, including myself, are new to this committee. Yes. And um, uh, previously I'd served on health care, not economic development. And mm -hmm. while I think I've got a general understanding of VITA, I'd welcome, you know, your introductions to that. Well, cool. knowing your background, yeah. welcome you to the economic development arena. Um, we were going to split this up. Cassie was going to do the general about Vita, and then I will talk, and then m maybe you should talk about the more s the general, what's in the bill other than broadband, and then I can go more specifically into the funding and how, what we're thinking of it. Okay. I have to say, I'm going to be very honest, not that I am not always honest, <laughs> but I don't know that I've ever been this honest in a committee. <laughs> I don't know what this uh, broadband initiative is going to yield. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very important thing for us to do. I think we certainly have to try to do it. Mm -hmm. What we may all find out is that it's even too risky for us. Mm -hmm. I hope that's not the case. Mm -hmm. But if that is the case, I think what that does is give uh, a perspective on how it really has to be yeah. funded long term. Okay. So, just so you know, that's kind of where yeah. we're coming from. That's Good. It. We're open to any suggestions, too. I mean, you know, <laughs> VITA is the most likely mechanism at this point. Absolutely. And but, we're certainly, but, um, um, we, we talked with Ted, and, and we're very willing to do it. In fact, we think it's part of our economic development mission to absolutely see what we can do here. Just can't, don't know enough about the industry right. and the players yet. We'll do our due diligence. We'll look at each project, see what we can do. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so on that note. I, I, know, I don't mean to be a downer. <laughs> <laughs> we do want to keep Vita going, and um, we do undertake, uh, you know, public policy <coughs> initiatives. Um, 
We've been around for over 40 years, and we are um, one of the quasis. We're not an agency, so we are self-funded. We have a board of 15 members. Five of them are um, um, ex officio, and then the remaining 10 are appointed by the governor. Um, our board Excuse me one second. Mm -hmm. I noticed you don't have anything. Oh. Would you like us to pass this out? Uh, is it on your pads? Do you have it on your pads? We, okay. we do. Sorry, um, but, sorry to interrupt. But, but members may want um, hard copies. I will so. just leave them here yeah. for anyone that wishes. Okay. Yeah, At the end. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Um, our, uh, we are a finance authority, so our business is making loans generally. Um, we do um, we do some bonds, but we're a conduit issuer of bonds. Um, and we also run some programs on behalf of the state, um, such as the drinking water, now it's the drinking water and clean water program, the Brownsfield uh, loan program, um, the Wyndham County Economic Development Loan Program. These are, these are funds that we do the underwriting and we um, collect a fee on behalf of the state and we service those loans. But the bread and butter of what we do is direct loans um, for small business and agricultural lending. And our, so those are the two main sectors, commercial and agricultural lending. Um, our agricultural lending is, um, a large portion of that is dairy. When we first got into agricultural lending, it was predominantly dairy. Over the course of time, that has been diversified a fair amount. Um, and you can see on the first page of the About Vita, there's a pie chart that gives you the industry sectors and the breakdowns. We are a small business lender. So um, even though we, um, we call, you know, we do bonds and we do agricultural lending and we do what we call our sub five lending, you know, in Vermont, it's it's small business loans. Our average loan size is just under two hundred fifty thousand dollars. We finance startups. We finance entrepreneurs. Um, we finance in partnership with banks. So typically, we um, are um, taking about forty percent of a project. The bank is financing fifty percent will finance 40% and the remaining 10% equity. So these are the projects that either the borrowers don't have enough equity to meet, say, typical financial institution equity requirements, or um, they're in industries where financial institutions shy away from um, lending up to more than X percent of the value of that collateral and we come in to lend support or enhance that credit to make the deal happen. And that's sort of the economic development that we provide. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, definition of small business? Or well, have we, you used more than one? Or Yeah, okay. we don't have a definition as far as like maximum revenue size or um, uh, number of employees. Um, I'm using that term in the sense of um, small in that like our average loan size being less than $250,000. That's small relative to <clears throat> say what a typical commercial transaction at a bank would be that would fall into commercial and, and a lot of <coughs> banks would have that in their branch system. So it, it really is the, the small business sector. Um, that's not to say that we don't participate in some of the larger businesses out there. It could be that it's, um, for example, we have um, our sub three loan program is for local and regional development corporations. We'll get involved in industrial park development. Um, we'll get involved in, some of you may have heard of the Long Falls um, project that we recently did um, down in Brattleboro. Um, we've been involved in some of, many of the larger names in Vermont over the course of time, where you know, it may have been early on in the 
company's history, you know, <laughs> actually what's really fun about Vita is that we've probably been involved <laughs> in any, most of the companies that you can think of, like Ben and Jerry's, Papa and Mills, all these companies, Vita has at one point in time been involved in somehow financing or helping the company along the way. Dealer.com, there's just, I mean, the names go on and on. So there are large names out there, but our sort of bread and butter is the small business lending. Um, we do fund ourselves, as I say, we um, are not an agency. We sell commercial paper, um, and then we mark that up um, and reloan that money. So from that mechanism, it's, it's like a bank. Um, but part of our um, mission is to provide um, low-cost capital to our borrowers to the extent that we can and still cover our overhead. Um, we have used state appropriations to help us with specific um, public policy initiatives, um, such as what we're here for today, or in the past, um, some other interest reserves that we've needed for specific <coughs> programs. Um, but generally, we are self-funded. I mean, might be a good example of right where Hurricane we got some Irene, state where we did uh, an emergency flood loan program where we put a lot of money out the door in a very short period of time. The state helped us with establishing <coughs> some um, uh, loan loss reserve provisions for that program as well. Um, do we use very little of it? I don't exactly. Yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. We used very little of it. I should have the number on the top of my head, but I don't. It was successful. Mike, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so you said you borrow, your handout says you borrow uh, money from banks, right, and then reload it. Right. Um, do, do the businesses get a better interest rate as a result of it being backed by the state? Yes, right. That's so the, that's the value. That you have. Right. We do have support in the form of moral obligation mm -hmm. from the state, which allows us to borrow from our banks at a better rate, and so then we can pass that on to our borrowers. So that moral <coughs> obligation is key to our ability to fund ourselves and keep the rate as low as possible. Mm -hmm. okay. Cassie, I don't want to go too much into the minutia, okay. um, but to the extent it might be relevant as we get into um, some of the broadband loan program here, um, one of the things I do want to understand is um, how Vita's funding sources overlap with, Mike had asked about banks, um, you know, in this legislation there's discussion about um, bonding, uh, you know, state bonding, um, the level of state bonding, um, and what Vita draws on there. Um, and then you also mentioned commercial paper, which I think of as a very short maturity um, source of funds. So, um, uh, and it looks like you have 250 to 300 million dollars of loans outstanding. Um, the funding for that money that you put out, some of it comes from banks, some of it comes from bonding, or no? No? Okay. Can I just keep Yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, we're not, there will be no geo bonds issued for this. Mm -hmm. We will get more moral obligation. Mm -hmm. And I think the statute, I was confused when I first read it because it's, talking about the telecom authorities, mm -hmm. $40 million in moral obligation. Okay. Um, and that is what this additional, the way I understand it, this additional moral obligation will be coming to us. Okay. Um, but there's no geo bonding. We've never... Okay. That's not a source of funds for no. you. But, but, um, but a source of... Um, if you will, um, state support for VITA is that um, moral obligation backing, where the state has um, so much moral obligation that it's willing to take on, and this was a conversation we had with Treasurer Pierce yesterday, um, and that what this bill does is uh, it, uh, I believe, lowers the amount of moral obligation related to the Vermont Telecom Authority um, bonding um, and increases the amount um, uh, uh, more generally uh, under the state of Vermont so that the, the, the amount of um, moral obligation is the same. Okay. 
that's helpful to me. I hope I haven't confused other people on that. This is a switch, like six million dollars from here to there, right? right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Rob. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Um, <laughs> on the second page of the the handout, um, the. Right here, you said the bonds are not a financial liability of Vita or the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, right. can you explain more about how that works? Yep. So, so Vita is is a conduit issuer. So, in other words, we we do a do underwriting, um, and then these bonds are um, generally they're private placement. So, a bank typically would buy the bonds. And so there's no credit risk on the part of the state, and there's no, um, the state is not um, on the hook for the bonds. So when the bank buys the bonds, they assume the risk as well? Yeah. They're bonds I'm for just companies. Learning Those are different than the bonds. Right. These are private yeah. activity bonds. Yeah. Those are Many different small things. manufacturers or 501c3 corporations. Thank you. And then one other um, follow-up question I had. Um, what's been the historic um, kind of loan loss experience that Vita has had? And the reason I'm asking that is because, and you had already um, uh, drawn out one of the things we're going to discuss here is, you know, what, a, you know, a broadband um, loan through Vita might look like as a credit risk relative to kind of what your historical experience is. So I'm curious what your historic experience has been. Yeah. Um, well, given what we do, um, our historical um, experience has, has not been too bad. Uh, it's been about, I think it's about 1%. 1%. Yeah. Um, and our ag portfolio, um, our loss rate has been actually phenomenally low. Um, and that's primarily because of the nature of that portfolio being folks' homes, farms. Um, that's to distinguish it from delinquencies. I mean, we do have an ongoing um, issue right now with that industry and in that it's, it is in um, a down cycle. Um, but to your question, our, um, our take on broadband is this is, this is going to be high risk. Um, there typically will not be the hard assets to collateralize these loans. Um, you know, there is a reason <laughs> they haven't been, th these rural areas haven't already been built out. The economics are very challenging and difficult. Um, so we, we're looking at this as <coughs> a high, higher risk potential <coughs> than probably our existing portfolio has already. Um, so we factored in, I think, a 10% loss rate um, with a potential 20% recovery on any collateral, if there is any collateral. So that sounds pretty conservative, but it may not be, it may or may not be. It's unproven at this point. Go ahead. So, so with the I mean, um lending, what was the loss rate there? It was well under our normal loss rate. Was it really? Okay. Absolutely. And we were very, we were surprised because we had to put out that money so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, people understood, you know, and it was, um, it was really good. Um, it was less than our normal loss rate. Um, less than 1%. Yeah. And, well, on the small business, the, the normal loss rate is about 2.58%. So this one was less than that. Um, the thing about these, this program is that um, also it, the loan size will probably be larger <coughs> and fewer projects. So even if one tanks, that will impact the loss rate. Two tanks, you see, so versus if it's spread out amongst a lot of little loans, it's different, so. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna ask about the uh, Moral Obligation Authority, 
um, that, that, that Vita has, uh, $175 million, and that, I suppose, leverages a certain dollar volume of, of loans that you can Mm -hmm. That you can make is is that does that vary or what is what, what is that? What I'm wondering is I think I, yeah, I, I got okay. Um, we have about as um, Representative Brigland said, we have about well it's almost 300 now in total. Well, it's a little over 300 in total assets. About 275, let's say, million of that is loans. We have different sources that we borrow from. They don't all have the moral obligation behind them. Mm -hmm. um, the commercial paper does. Um, some of the bank loans do. We also have some cash that we have as a reserve that's set up to back those programs. So we've leveraged for 175, we've got 275. And if you look at a graph, David loves, David's our CFO, and he loves to do the graph. So we, you know, moral obligation goes like this, our portfolio goes like that. So we are leveraging more as time goes on and people become comfortable. <coughs> We're actually looking at getting our own rating now. So what that would, we hope, do is have us be less dependent on a moral obligation. Question, questioning rather, you know, S&P or Moody's, what they would rate us at what that means to our lenders in terms of the rates there. Because, you know, we have very narrow spreads. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we do do is, um, in addition to using the moral obligation, we also got some money from the feds, oh God, 10 years ago now? Yeah, with <coughs> the um, meltdown there in 2008. Um, mm -hmm. So we've used that, and we still have a tiny bit left for subsidies. In other words, we buy our rates down so they're lower. It's, but that's, it's not that complicated. You borrow it, you mark it up, you buy it down to a normal rate, and you lend it. Buy low, sell high. I have another question, and actually, I think it's for Ted. Um, and, and it's with regard to the assumption that these will be large, larger loans. Have we done, should we do? any kind of modeling about how these financing pieces are going to stack up um, when we're thinking about that, um, the, this piece or the bonding piece. Have you guys done any of that? Is that how, you know, is that something we should do? Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? David, I think that's what you mean, modeling that David yeah. did? Or? I, think, uh, we're, I think she's asking about the different so the way it would stack. So yeah. if you had oh, okay. bonding, Vita, private equity, private bank all involved, our assumption has been that for the Vita program, most of these applicants would be coming to Vita for uh, the entire cost of the project, less than 10% equity they'd be required to bring. That equity is likely going to come in the form, we assume, based on the five or six providers we talked to, we, we assume that that equity is going to come in the form of uh, 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 customer acquisition, uh, equity of the partners, of the people that are running the program, but that 10% could possibly come from mm -hmm. any, many places. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, you have the connectivity fund and how does that, how is that involved with it, which we want to see some sort of a uh, convergence there between what Vita's doing, the town's doing, and what PSD is doing. So for our purposes, we assume for Vita, it's, it, it would be almost the whole project would be funded by the Vita project. So here's kind of where I'm, where that question is coming from. When I think about some of the startups that we've heard from, like EC Fiber, um, uh, Newbury Ready, I've heard, you know, um, they have been missing CV Fiber the first dollars, like to kind of get things. And I don't know that that's where they. I mean, that's not where EC Fiber went after. You know, it was like, how do we get? it up so I'm um, just it's just a it's just a point I'm thinking about yeah. and <clears throat> I look at the, the example I'm most uh, closely familiar with is uh, Kingdom Fiber mm -hmm. and how uh, the town of Craftsbury went about seeking grants when they get grants to for, for that 
to, to establish what they wanted to do, which brought the private provider in, and that private provider then would go and try to find funding to build the rest of their system. That's that's kind of the simplest way I understand this, but I think there's so many other ways they could come in, and you're right. The first dollar in could be a grant, it could be equity from a wealthy business partner to a business, or it could be a town appropriation. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways you could get that first fifty, hundred, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars you need to do planning, feasibility, uh, and other elements. As I see in the omnibus bill, you folks have built some of that into it. Mm -hmm. And just one more piece, and, and I see Joe. Well, I'm I was conf I think I confused you. So go ahead, and then I'll uh, yeah, just in terms of in, in terms of this assumption that they would be larger. Is there a number that you think you can do at this? Have you? I mean, is that a calculation that's been made, or mm -hmm. we modeled between we modeled a two million dollar six two million dollar loan. Okay. Now, is that does that make it even more risky? Of course, you have six companies. I don't think it's going to be, and I know Ted's done a lot of research, so that's his best estimation right now. Mm -hmm. It may be that what happens is Vita comes in and says, we can't do $2 million here. We can do $500, and you're going to have to find the money. Um, you've been talking about the municipal bonding, and I've been <coughs> talking about Vita not using bonding, so I think that's, I confused you a little bit, I'm sorry. Um, EC5 was an interesting um, case. I sat on the Telecom Authority for a while when they were looking for funds. <coughs> and what they ended up doing, as you probably know, is they issued bonds and sold them to people in the uh, service area that were willing to pay for them. Um, I don't see why that wouldn't work on a smaller scale, perhaps, mm -hmm. in some of these smaller towns. Um, maybe the town doesn't bond, maybe the company bonds, and people don't have probably the kind of money that they have in a, in a wealthy area, but maybe they'd be willing to pay a thousand dollars or whatever, mm -hmm. and you put it all together, and then maybe you have a viable system. I don't know. We haven't looked at it yet. You, I have to look at every situation, every project, and see what we can sort of figure out with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, just something I want to mention. Um, this bill talks about, as, as you've noted, a couple of different types of funding to support um, whether it's a CUD, whether it's a municipality, whether it's a for-profit or a non-profit entity. And I think unequivocally the most risky money that we're talking about here is the grant money because that money's not coming back. That is money that is going out to support a municipality or a CUD and there's going to be no repayment on that. Um, and that's in contrast to what we're f referring to is, you know, whether it's a, what's the length, um, high risk loans um, or, you know, higher, uh, higher than historic loss rate, you know, th th the, but the fact of the matter is that a loan we expect to be repaid back. So by definition, it's um, infinitely less risky than the grant money we're talking about here, which under no circumstances is going to be paid back. So I just want to make sure we level set as to where the risk profile is about the money that we're talking about here. Grant money, really high risk. It's not coming back to the state. Loans, um, there's full expectation that that money be repaid, though the credit risk on those loans may be higher. And so. just so you know, we're, we put that language in there yeah. because I wanted people to understand we added to your bill. It's unequivocal. Um, <laughs> that, you know, I don't want this to something bad to happen and somebody to come back to us yeah. and say, you idiots. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As long as we are all are very clear what yeah. we're going to do. And, and that's something we want to take a look. I mean, the, the, the um, in, uh, in Section 11 of this bill, the, the Broadband Expansion Loan Program, uh, it, it very specifically says, it is understood that the loans under the program are high-risk loans to likely startup businesses, and therefore losses in the program will be much higher than the authority's historic loss rate. I thought I took out the word much. But oh, still in ours. <laughs> maybe, we're, maybe we're a draft behind you, Jeff. But, um, no, probably not. But I, I mean, I think that's helpful to, to be clear as to what these loans would look like relative to the... Um, you know, more typical loan in Vita's portfolio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we just want to be honest yeah. about that, and we and just I want the committee to also know we think it's really important. It's really important from an economic development standpoint. 
it's for education. There are so many reasons that we have to get internet everywhere for, for the workforce to be able to come and live here and do what they do from home and small business. Um, so that's why we're willing to try it. And yeah. we're putting up $3 million of our own money if we have to. So it would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it would be helpful uh, for me, uh, and, and I don't mean to speak for the committee, but um, in this section of the bill, uh, whenever I see a column of numbers, I add them up to see if they actually um, add up to the, to the numbers at the, uh -oh. at, the, at the bottom of the column. No, and it's just um, helping me understand um, some of the numbers that we have in this section and um, what is being proposed. So what we're talking about here is um, financing for projects of, let's call it $12 million, 10% mm -hmm. of that coming from, um, I think as uh, Treasurer Pierce referred to it as skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So whether it's the municipality, CUD, nonprofit, for-profit, putting in 10% of that money. Right. The other $10.8 million is, um, <clears throat> is essentially what Vita would have in terms of authority uh, mm -hmm. to make Correct. loans. Yeah. Um, so that's fairly clear to me. We're also talking about an appropriation here of five hundred and forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, which I view as um, essentially reserve money to support uh, loans that could potentially be underperforming or not paid back. That's correct. So there would be an appropriation in two thousand twenty of a reserve mm -hmm. funded mm -hmm. uh, in the event some of these loans, a portion of these loans, aren't paid back. Correct. And. Uh, uh, that would be supported out of, out of that reserve. Can I just? Yep. That's please, because please jump in. We have to book in reserve. Yep. These loans are risky. And so that's five percent of the potential lending authority for Vita. Well, five. we figure maybe we do half year one, okay. half year two. So that's ten. So it's ten percent. It's ten percent. Okay. Um, is that a good number? I don't know. I think it's awfully high compared to, but you know, some people have. What if they all go bad? Well, that's eight and a half million for the state and three million for Vita. Well, then there's also pacing as to how quickly these loans are made. That's right. That's right. And we'd like to get them <coughs> made, obviously, so people. And I know a lot of these companies. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Ted, are already in the business and need money for expansion, capital, working capital. So um, when we say startup, it's not your typical startup. I don't think. I think they're up and going. Some of them. I think the intention of this is there, you know, it, it's, some, it's a term that's been thrown around here. I think we are technology agnostic, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, the end of that dirt road to get that person um, <coughs> broadband access or to get that farmer um, broadband access, whether it's the cable company, whether it's the wireless provider, whether it's a CUD that starts up, we want to see access out there. And um, so some of those business models may be up and running, um, others may be startups. Um, so I, I think there's a wide range of business models that could, yeah. that you could potentially support right. yes. through this. I would agree. And then every year, you know, again, let's say we make year two book and reserve. Probably by the end of the year two, you really haven't lost any money, right. but you have reserves, which our accountants make us have. And if we don't get them from somewhere, then it shows up on our income statement. And our lenders don't like that. Yeah. Um, as you know, we have modeled it um, and shown a worst case scenario, shown a 50% loss rate, shown a 25% loss rate. Um, to be honest, we need to get into, and we're going to have a lot of help from the Public Service Department and from ACCD. Um, to become familiar with where we really are, what might work there, do these projections look right, or are they way off? Um, so we're going to do a lot of due diligence, but have help from people that are in the industry. So you have a question? Yeah. Uh, so we are also, as part of this bill, um, envisioning uh, the putting out some technical assistance funds yes, for CUDs, municipalities, to do some planning. Yeah, that's true. Which feels like a guardrail of sorts mm -hmm. um, on the risk aspect here. Are there any specific um, <coughs> other guardrail or pieces of those planning that um, 
you feel would be really important for communities to undertake or municipalities to undertake? Um, I was um, how much money is 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 that forty seven thousand dollars? So it, it comes in two forms. Um, one, there's an appropriation in here that would support um, CUDs, um, municipalities that are actually doing business planning for what that model would look like look like in their area. Okay. Again, it could, could be different. So this is this is new. Oh, great. Yesterday. Oh, super. <laughs> um, and then the, the other context that comes in is um, funding a, uh, a human um, at the at the public service department who would have um, uh, who would be working with uh, localities on how do you support your business model, how do you form a CUD. Um, that work right now is really being done on a grassroots basis mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where Carol Monroe's phone rings or you know Herb Tomei's phone rings at EC Fiber and someone says, hey, can you help us out? We're looking to uh, form a CUD. Mm -hmm. We want to institutionalize that so that that support for uh, you know regions, localities, um, it's it's not just you know a volunteer hoping that you know that that somebody answers the phone. That's great. I think that's really needed because, um, as I recall, it wasn't very much money when I was listening to it in Senate Finance, and I thought, oh, yes. well, that's yeah. the Senate. <laughs> 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 um, okay. And I had a second uh, on the question on this. So I think we envision these <coughs> planning exercises. These problems that are getting solved, um, in addition to being technology agnostic, you know, also we may be working with traditional carriers on this, or mm -hmm. startup carriers, mm -hmm. you know, uh, providers. And so is there any sense of um, increased or diminished risk, depending on whether or not we're working with an established <coughs> provider or startup? Uh, and by established, you know, I mean, I'm thinking about some of our national mm -hmm. providers mm -hmm. that are here that have not built out to the last mile who may see this as an opportunity to do so. Well, as the chairman just pointed out, I, I think we have to be technology agnostic. Mm -hmm. And that would, um, I, I know, not so little, but I do know about this, that there is uh, some kind of tension, I mm -hmm. say, perhaps, between some of the larger carriers and the smaller um, folks trying to to start up, um, and I would hate to put a Vermont company that we believe that's going to be successful um, at a disadvantage. On the other hand, the first person you have to think about is your customer. Um, what's going to be the best for them? And you know, then you have to think about the finances and all those things, obviously. But um, I would say. Depending on the situation, we wouldn't we wouldn't throw them out. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so for and I had been thinking of this mostly in terms of smaller startups, the CEDs. Yes, yeah, so that as was I. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, as a if as opposed as opposed to Comcast, who nationally has deep pockets, I don't know what their Vermont situation is. Mm -hmm. Um, would it be advantageous for a large national or international company to borrow money as opposed to doing it internally? Would, would they avail themselves of something like that? I don't know. I mean, it would all depend on their, their situation and how much they can borrow elsewhere at, at what rate. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, um, the Vice Chair is correct in saying that it would take away some of the risk in the total portfolio. Mm -hmm. And that's something we would want to consider. Um, so there's a lot of different um, impacts coming in, and I think we have to try to consider all of them, which will be difficult. It's like and one of the things I think Cassie said is, in general, Vita has an economic de development mission and a prudent lending mission. Sometimes those two are really hard to put together. You know, you find you find the balance between <coughs> economic development uh, and prudent lending, and sometimes, and I think it's exactly the same thing you're dealing with here, just in a different <coughs> industry, a, a difficult industry, let's say. Right. Yeah, this may not be a, 
a concern or, or interest uh, in your regard, but for me, um, I represent uh, Lowell G. Westfield, Troy, and Eden. Mm -hmm. Pretty rural as you're going to get. Sure. Uh, uh, my concern is, you know, with any of the other bigger towns, uh, they generally have somebody on staff a lot of times to mm -hmm. write grants, to, you know, get get the head start on any of this sort of stuff. Yeah. So, you know, from my perspective, I'd, I'm hoping that we can somehow level the playing field a little bit with, with some of the more rural towns, whether it's with the CUDs mm -hmm. or, you know, mm -hmm. Northeast Canyon Collaborative can, you know, get together a bunch of towns. but. It, it's going to be a, it's going to be a challenge in, in my towns up there because yeah, right sure now is. I don't think it's really on the radar other than looking at private providers to yeah. expand yeah. in the town. So. I think that's what, I think what you're suggesting um, having a person a sort of an omnibus person at the PSD is, is really important and really a good idea. Well, and we've seen that in terms of um, you know as select boards wrestle with this and you've got folks on the select board who have their hands full with kind of the day-to-day -day municipal operations and then um, think about how to solve broadband issues in their town um, I mean there's a level of complexity here just in terms of the business model that I think it's a way above and beyond to, to ask uh, you know local volunteers to organically all over the state um, you know, come up with that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's one of the orientation behind making a, a resource available that's not calling TV fiber or EC fiber, asking them to kind of, you know, mm -hmm. come, come, well, you expand or come help us. Yeah. Um, show us how you did that. Yeah. So, um, and so I, it just, I want to go a little more granular and, and not too deeply, but um, just helping me understand mm -hmm. the numbers. Um, we do have something here that might be helpful. Yeah. We have lots of papers. Okay. This but so in, in our bill currently, um, I'd mentioned the $540,000 um, kind of uh, 2020 reserve um, that's in there. We also make reference to um, the accumulated total of the appropriation, and this is, I believe, the lending of the program, should not exceed $8.5 million. Uh huh. And so, you know, we've talked about $12 million of projects, 10.8 um, lending authority for VITA, and... Um, Three million for VITA, that VITA will take, what, the way we envision it, and <laughs> people may say it's a little crazy, but um, anything over our normal loss rate, yeah. which I think, <clears throat> again, I didn't want to confuse anybody, Big commercial, 1%, small business, 2.58. Okay. Okay. Um, this will go in the small business. And so anything above that, we will share with the state, 75, 25, okay. up to $3 million. Okay. It will come over time, so it won't, I, I won't say it will be easy for us to take that into our balance sheet if we have to, but yep. we can. Um, the eight and a half million is if everything fails. We got eight and a half million from the state, three million from Vita, um, approximately. So that's okay. Yeah. So that I mean, and I was scared to put the eight. I, I thought you don't want to put the eight and a half million there because you're going to scare everyone. Yeah. But that's the reality. If everything fails, no. now we're not expecting that. No. Again, we did a fifty percent loss, twenty five percent loss, ten percent loss, just to see what that would mean, and then don't know that we yeah we do it's right here on the, on the sheet yep so actually he did it over and did let's assuming we get six projects one of them fails two fail three fail right um, yeah so can you can you take me through um you know one of these lines or or several of them sure yeah so <laughs> let's go with one of six i yeah. like that one the best I, great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so year one, we're taking 540 is just a, um, it's an accounting, it's a reserve. Yep. Year two, it's probably also a reserve. Okay. Year three is when some of your portfolio actually starts, you, re you start losing real money. Okay. And then year four, that actually goes back to the state, the way the, the numbers all you know, the waterfall comes down. Um, in year five, um, the state ends up getting 
um, 685,000 back, and they've given us a total of 971 minus 103. So the total state loss, total state loss. If I think maybe that's what we should should uh, concentrate. Okay. Total state loss. If one of the six projects fails, is 1.1 million, or 76 percent of uh, the losses, and Vita's loss is 371. Okay. So can I play this back to you to see if I understand it? Yeah. So what line one represents is um, six projects are financed. Yes. And uh, $10.8 million <coughs> is lent. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in year one, um, we do an appropriation to fund $540,000 of reserve. Mm -hmm. um, in year two, based on credit quality, loan loss experience, we do an additional appropriation of $442,000. Correct. Year three, one of those six projects is looking um, uh, less sunny, yes. let's say. And so the assessment is that a higher appropriation <coughs> needs to be done to that reserve fund mm -hmm. um, just based on credit quality. Year four and year five, um, losses from that one project start to occur, and VITA... Um, uh, well, they occur in year three, actually, okay. and in year four, we're collecting, we're, I think we figured 20% recovery on some of the collateral. Okay. Okay. So, it, well, so you just answered one of my questions. There, there's an assumption of a small amount of recovery here yes. on that. On the, on if, if the company totally tanks, we yep. assumed maybe you could get 20%. Maybe you could get more. I okay. mean, I just, we don't know if somebody going to want to come in, maybe a large carrier, because it's all built out now. Right. And pay something for right. it. Right. Okay. It seems like it's got to be worth something. Yep. And However, so, so at the, at the end of year five, the, 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 the occurrence is that um, the state has incurred 76% of the losses mm -hmm. on that one project that didn't pay off. Right. And VITA um, has incurred 24% of those losses That's for that, that one That's project. That's right. yeah. Okay. Um, and it's the same, you know, it's, it right. follows all the way down. G going down. Um, you know, it's, uh, okay. again, I was hesitant to put the eight and a half million in there, but because we're not, the reality is we're going to make a loan if we believe that the company has the capability, management, financial, etc., to survive long term. Not that we're not going to make a bad decision, perhaps, mm -hmm. it happens yeah. in lending. Mm -hmm. um, well, and as it says in, the, in, in, in this draft legislation, uh, the authority shall not make a loan unless the authority has a reasonable expectation of the long-term viability of the business. And I would say that... Did I put that into it? Yes, you did. Well, <laughs> that's, that sounds kind of like you. Yeah. Well, you yeah. hear your voice there. But, but the, the, po the point is um, also um, to, to underscore something Representative Sibeli had said earlier, what we're doing elsewhere in this legislation is... Um, we are looking to fund through grants, mm -hmm. essentially uh, the business modeling of what these um, what these projects would look like um, through feasibility work that whether it's a CUD or a municipality exactly. would do. And Thank you know, you. part of the hope there is that um, you know, as a CUD looks to come forward to Vita for a loan. Work has been done, and maybe some of those will decide. You know what? This is a business model that doesn't work for us, and that doesn't even rise to your attention as a prospective project. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned feasibility studies because that's going to be an important consideration for us, and hopefully they will be done through the person in yeah. the public service, um, and maybe some other. I mean, we have thought maybe we'll have to get a consultant on board to help us. Um, with feasibility mm -hmm. of the projects, etc. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it seems like so we're really looking for solutions to be manufactured, which I believe are possible yeah. Yeah. in all of these places. Yeah. So, giving folks the tools to manufacture a solution yeah. where one has not been available yet. My question was just wanting to 
check in around. I heard you say companies, and then I thought, oh, but it's also municipality. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. for some reason, I'm sorry, I'm so focused That's okay. on our part of it. But and I went back and right. looked at the language of eligible borrowers and saw that I had left myself a note um, that the chair has actually frequently brought up, which is utilities. So would utilities be able to access these types of funds? This, this number. And I, I mean, Honestly, I, I view most of these loans being taken out by some municipal entity, but I mean, we want to, you know, we have some feasibility around utilities, so. I don't know why off the top of my head. It's not something that I know, um, maybe there's something I don't understand why they shouldn't, but my thought would be, why wouldn't you open it up to as many potential um, companies or builders solutions or solutions, thank you, yeah. um, as you possibly could. So um, I don't want to put this in a footnote category, but I, Ted, I've got a question for you. And um, uh, a few weeks ago when you were in committee with um, Commissioner Tierney and had talked about some of the administration's um, you know, thoughts on this and, and kind of the, the um, proposal, <coughs> generally speaking, and this legislation reflects it. Um, this legislation would establish something called the Think Vermont Innovation Fund, which would um, be something under the ACCD umbrella. And um, there's an appropriation in here that would essentially kick off that that um, innovation fund. I mean, it, it, for, for what I understand, that funding would be used for. I'm very supportive of it. Just a question I have is, um, it's uh, it, it's being an ACCD, um, uh, and and we're gonna we we'll have multiple programs going here. Um, you know, the connectivity fund and you know funding uh, high cost areas and connectivity initiative um, orientation, and then a, you know I think Vermont Innovation Fund. I'm trying to put a hat on to think about how that is different, and is it you know would it be confusing to prospective um, folks who would benefit from you know from those grants? And just if you could give us a little bit of thought on on that. So the thing for my innovation fund was created last year. Okay. Uh, and it has six charges. Okay. Uh, and originally the uh, the governor had asked for I believe a half million dollars last year to fund the thing for my innovation fund. Okay. It was housed at the agency of commerce, and it was everything from co-working spaces to aviation economic development to broadband. Okay. And uh, we put out an RFP. Uh, we got 150,000 of the 500,000 we asked for. Uh, we put out an RFP and, and we received more than a half million dollars of requests. Okay. Uh, we looked at those. We have three broadband related applications sitting before us. We looked at our total ask and we said, there's of those six charges, we'd love to fund at least one from each charge, multiple from each charge. The average grant amount was about $20,000 that was requested. And so uh, we recognized uh, we had the potential to fund those three if we asked for additional funds this year. Yeah. And so we proposed using $45,000 of uh, carry uh, for actually, if, uh, it was originally a uh, budget adjustment, yeah. but punted to carry forward uh, to fund those three applications. Okay. Uh, at the time, there, there is no place in state government to go to get broadband funding, broadband planning and feasibility funding. Yeah. Think Vermont Innovation Fund is the only place you can go to get it. It already existed, so it made sense to put it there. In context of everything else in your broadband omnibus bill, uh, you know, maybe that's worth reevaluating. Um, uh, certainly, the Agency of Commerce has a pretty good track record of making and monitoring grants. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the Public Service Department, uh, they have a connectivity fund, yep. but we, we have 30 to 40 programs we run of grant and tax credit programs. So we kind of have just a wheelhouse of doing grant management. Uh, so there's you know things to weigh there. However, you're a customer and you want to do broadband, where do you go? Yeah. I can understand why you might think public service is where I should go. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, well, I yeah. think a case can be made that this is economic development too. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, and I also want to be clear that um, the way <coughs> the Think Vermont Innovation Fund is currently structured, um, is it necessary to um, broaden the categories to which you can um, 
uh, fund grants here to include broadband? Because we have new language in this bill that does that. that. I, I don't think it's necessary. Okay. Um, I don't think it's necessarily harmful. But I don't think it's necessary. The statute, existing statute says broadband is an eligible use of the funds. Yeah. And our intention would be to fund the three applications that we have on broadband right. uh, with that funding. Now, that obviously could be com a little confused. We look, we're about to make the announcements. Yeah. Well, we, we better hurry up then. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, the, it could be confusing. We could end up having to issue a new RFP for additional broadband projects yeah. if because we didn't get it through the budget adjustment process. So, okay. it's, but, but any. The reason it's so little and the reason it's in Think for My Innovation is because the program exists, we have the existing authority, and we have the existing grant application. <laughs> right. Got it. Okay. That's helpful. <coughs> May I make a request? You may. Um, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I don't In the bill, it says that the money goes to ACCD and mm -hmm. then to VEDA. Um, that's never been the case uh, when we've done a special program for the state. I think it would be much quicker easier if it came directly to us. It always has. Um, otherwise, you have to grant it to us, and it becomes a whole. Uh, we've never done that before. So, so can you, um, I don't know if you have the specific section there. I just, just have it here. Section 12. Yes, section 12, which is okay. on page 15, line 10. So I would say $500,000 is appropriated to the Vermont Economic Development Authority to serve as a loan loss. Okay. Oh, 540000 Yeah, how much did I say? Oh, sorry. And the agency has absolutely no issue with that. Uh, just a budget construct as we're doing this. It was put into the agency's budget, so it has to get to VEDA somehow the way that was done. But. Um, We've got no issue with it going directly to be that as it has in the past. Great. I've exhausted okay. my question. So. I just have one more. So this document, has it made its way to our committee assistant or to Ledge Council? I mean, it might be helpful uh, for the fiscal note. It should have this okay. morning. It was late, but I believe it did. I have an email copy of it, so I, okay. if Sarah doesn't have it, I can. I'm sorry, Sarah. We. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it. Um, we'll, send it. we'll send it again, yes. Okay. We were still working on it last night. Great. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Very yeah, helpful. no, it was very helpful to, to The other thing we're going numbers. to send you is um, everything that we've done. We thought you might be interested in, in our energy programs as well. So we'll send you we'll a little. I think that was emailed as well. Okay, yeah. Super. Oh, yeah. We'll send it again. Just Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. 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 There are many reasons that we'd love to have you here, and we can talk about many things today, um, and, and maybe some of those things will come up, but um, really our focus, I think, as you know, is uh, the Appropriations Committee has asked uh, Energy and Technology Committee to um, provide a recommendation or opine upon uh, some of the initiatives in the governor's budget, um, including those related to ADS. And so, um, you know, would welcome your input in kind of talking us through some of those things, and I'm sure there'll be questions, but um, th that would be great if you could help us with that. Sure. So, so for a little history, um, I, I came in earlier in the session and we talked about $1.8 million that was for uh, firewall upgrades, switches, routers, and some network equipment that needed to be replaced um, due to some risk on the state. Um, when we put together the budget, when we looked at the BAA money, we specifically um, broke it into two buckets. What was absolute emergency right now and what could we wait a little longer for? So the bucket was split into two. It was originally 2.3 and we split it into 1.8 that we've talked about and I believe is 
uh, being voted on now. And then there's $500,000 that um, I considered necessary to do, but not in emergency or at least um, due to um, priorities of getting that other equipment installed. Um, I felt that this, this was secondary to that. So this $500,000 is for wireless access point upgrades and security vulnerability assessments and network assessments. And that's broken out into two, two ways, $300,000 for security vulnerability assessments across the state and $200,000 for hardware, um, specifically related to our wireless access points in state buildings. When, when the state of Vermont started to put together a wireless network, it was, um, in, in my opinion, not well thought out as far as the funding model went. So, um, it, <laughs> um, in, in several ways, but uh, what the Department of Information and Info Innovation did was they would ask the department to fund the device but never built in any kind of life cycle, never built in any kind of support, never built in anything. Pay for the device, we'll configure it and put it up on the wall. And you guys be all set. Um, well, forever, right? And that no one had a, a longer view of what was gonna happen when the equipment got old, when it got vulnerable to security updates when it became end of life. And so throughout the past six months or so, we've started looking at that equipment and we have, um, over 400 of those wireless access points that are end of life at the end of 2019, along with the servers that uh, go in our data centers to control those 400 access points. So this is one of those areas that um, no fault to ADS specifically um, was never budgeted for in a traditional way before. I saw it as a uh, a fairly large security vulnerability because of the way um, it was pieced together and so I saw these two pieces going together as far as when I say two pieces the security assessments and the wireless access points and so when we purchase new wireless access points we'll be doing security vulnerabilities in those areas as well for, for security vulnerability assessments excuse me clarification yeah um, the the both the data wireless access points and the servers are vulnerable or is it the the two two breaches or is it the servers that are vulnerable and the wireless access points are just outdated by the end of 2019 um, they'll all be end of life, which means they'll no longer be <coughs> security updates. So they'll all be vulnerable. The the wireless service, the, the wireless wire, access yeah, points, the wireless access points, and the servers that they connect to, both. Yeah, that can. So let me explain that a little further, just just to clarify. The servers that they connect to are the servers that can really um, control a certain number of access points across the state. So the Montpelier complex would have a server that controlled 100 or so access points. Mm -hmm. Burlington would have a server that controlled 50 or so access points. We have five of those now. We've been working with our partners to consolidate that down and build a architecture that um, gives, us, gives us higher availability and more redundancy, but lowers the number of servers that we need so we're going from five to four um, so we're looking at you know doing it better at the same time not just a um, in-house you know straight up replacement so <clears throat> kind of uh, looking at the um, and we saw we saw this um, some of these uh, issues come up this summer or fall with the Joint Information Technology Committee, and I appreciate you know the bringing these forward. The notion of kind of capital planning for um, replacing these—I mean, does we're not you're not seeking funds to do any of that at this point? To so, I'm not seeing capital funds. Well, and, and that's a that's my own thinking. So 
think, thinking about, you know, we're installing something that we're going to have to replace. So not only are we asking for the funds um, to replace it, but we're thinking about that replacement and starting to budget to replace that in 20 years. You know, that notion of, I mean, I'm thinking of like capital equipment funds for right. town because that's right. what I have as a, is there any element right. of that Special happening funds. here? or elsewhere, or is that on your radar? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yep, that, that is on my radar, and that's one of the first things that, you know, I, I thought of when I you was know, gonna come in today, was, you know, if they're gonna ask me, you know, what's the plan? You can't come back in five years and do this to me again, right? I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't want that. So, um, this year, we're redoing all of our network contracts, and there's, uh, we're projecting about a $400,000 savings through renegotiating contracts. I plan to use that money in next year's budget to start to plan out the longer life cycle of these. So I won't have an up due to these in my budget next year. I'll be using existing funds to, to for support and um, uh, replacement costs. Is that what you're asking? Well, I wanna make sure, I wanna clarify what I yeah. just heard you say. Did you say ne the savings that you're going to generate this year on network plan contracts? Network contracts. Did you say that you're going to use that for to, for replacement of materials next year? Or did you say you're going to use that for thinking about the next 10 years? That's what I'm asking you about is how are we thinking about replacing these things in 10 years? Right. I'm talking about putting it on a life cycle so we have support going forward. We're continually working with our different partners to, to think about the longer term what our network looks like. And part of that $1.8 million, there's a lot of just standardized replacement of pieces of equipment. But we're also looking at how do we not build it for today, but how do we build it for tomorrow? And how, what equipment can we buy and put in place that will not only replace the equipment that's gone bad, but give us a, a path to the future where it may, where we may be able to consolidate equipment or become more secure, have the ability for higher bandwidth. So yes, we're we're continually looking at how we do things better in the future and making sure the equipment we buy isn't just for tomorrow, but yeah. it's it's got a longer. So I don't want to belabor time. this, but I'm going to belabor okay. it just because I think I it's something I really want the agency to be thinking. I would want the agency to be thinking about. So, and and it could be that we're just crossing each other with words, John. So I mean, I only right. the municipal um, perspective really to think about. So, you know, when we're 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 thinking about replacing our you know fire truck that we have to have because of one building in our town. You know, like we're not raising those funds every ten mil and ten years. We are budgeting a porch, so we're smoothing that cost out over. And so, are you saying that's what you're doing? I would love to do that. As a former selectman, I, I yes. understand exactly what you're talking yes. about. Yeah, special buckets for special projects or special pieces. That you're of smoothing equipment. the cost out over time. Right. You're putting twenty thousand dollars a year, yeah. a year towards a fire trucking, and yeah. twenty years you'll have yeah. half the cost. Yeah. Yeah. We don't currently do that. Um, we would like to do that, but that's something that we have to work with finance and management on. And I don't know what the rules are around creating those special buckets. But I absolutely understand what you're saying, and I'll talk to finance and management. So, and, and just to continue to belabor it for another yeah. moment, if I may, Mr. Chair, sure. um, we know that these things that you're purchasing in the budget have a finite mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And so for us to purchase them without any sense of how we will replace them just feels like we're potentially creating a future problem. So that's, and I think with the agency coming together, this feels like a, a very important function right. that hopefully the agency can take on for all of state government. Like how are we going to ensure that we have adequate access and financial, you know, that we've thought ahead. I, and I know you don't have a big, well, I shouldn't say I know you don't have Okay, I'm going to stop right there. So, I'm, my yeah, I'm not going to stop there because okay. uh, I think there is a bigger strategic consideration here that, yeah. that Laura has has picked at, and um, I'll pick at it a little bit more. And we're not going to get to it today, but I think it's something that working with you, this committee, should be looking at. 
and the strategic consideration is how we think of these expenditures um, as flowing through the general fund state budget relative to the you know the institutions uh, committee uh, capital budget because um, I think it's really important to think about where our technologies expenditures reside mm -hmm. um, and are we making capital uh, expenditures or are these really ongoing operating costs of government and frankly I think it's the latter mm -hmm. um, that that you know whether it's you know software expenditures that we're ramping up in terms of integ integrated eligibility but there's going to be ongoing maintenance costs of that right. that go on over time right. and the institutions committee is going to be pounding on our door saying wait a minute we thought we'd paid for finish that. this understandably but yeah. there are operating costs that continue uh, and 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 so we're getting a little off the appropriations committee um, uh, bill here but sorry I know, and I think it's a, this is really important. I think there's a broader strategic um, uh, uh, conversation that we need to have with ADS as to how do we fund technology in our state government, right. and and where do those costs reside? Um, you know, as capital expenditures or as kind of ongoing costs right. um, that are funded through the through the general fund. So. We're not going to solve that today, but I appreciate you bookmarking that as something that we need yeah. to kind of get into. I completely agree, and um, I, would, I would suggest making sure that finance and management um, is at the table when we discuss those things. I can, I can recommend um, to some extent, but finance and management really controls the different pieces of the budget and you know, whether we use, uh, at the end of the day, you know, they, they bring the recommendations to the governor usually. Uh, I'm there, but you know the finance commissioner will will say, you know, here's here's the pot of money we're going to use based on you know overall priority. So I think we should have a discussion. I just think that the uh, finance commissioner should be involved. I fully acknowledge there's lots of you know political yeah. and and public financing considerations uh, that go on as to you know who pays what when. Um, to, to dig more into the granularity, uh, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Okay, go ahead. Uh, and, and it's sort of related to that. Um, first, first, uh, let me ask you again for those numbers. You two hundred thousand for servers and two hundred thousand for wireless access points. Two hundred thousand dollars total for the wireless access network, which is wireless wireless, asset, wireless access points and the uh, uh, four servers that we'll need. Oh, so it's two hundred thousand for for total for that piece. Yes. Oh, okay. And then three hundred thousand for the security slash network assessment work. Okay, three hundred thousand. Okay. Did you say four servers or five? We have five now. We're going to consolidate down into four. So, um, just following on to uh, what Laura and Tim are uh, saying, there are there are well, the life cycle for a piece of hardware is probably five to seven years, right? Yes. And for software, it's even sooner than that because you constantly got to be upgrading it for um, security updates and things like that. Uh, I don't know how often the contracts have to be renewed for software, but uh, is it on an annual basis or is it uh, you know, every couple of years or what? We've changed that um, because com because software's changed. Mm -hmm. As we move towards software as a service, where the software is hosted usually by the vendor that makes the software and they're continually doing updates, mm -hmm. we don't look at the five-year cycle as much anymore. So it's not that the software's out of date in five years. We still have procurement rules around, you know, um, uh, no longer than seven-year contract <coughs> for IT. But software is changing in a way that doesn't give it the shelf life that it used to have necessarily. Right. Yeah, so um, I guess what I'm getting at is that it's not really a capital expense, it's an ongoing expense that you've yeah. got to keep updating this stuff continuously. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you budget that? Um, how do you know? that over the next three, four years, you're going to be spending this much on this, this much on that, um, and, you know, and uh, what's, what's going to be uh, ending its life cycle in each of the years and mm -hmm. has to be replaced. We've been moving, uh, part of our strategy has been moving from the 
capital expense to the operational expense. Mm -hmm. We did that with Office 365. We used to host all the servers. We used to do all that work. We used to redo the licenses every year. Now, uh, and so there was a you know, capital expense every five or six years for half a million or a million dollars or a million and a half, whatever it was. Now we're on a subscription model, so it's more of an operational expense, as you said. We've worked that into our budget to do every year. Mm. Where, where the challenge still is, is figuring out um, what the increase will be from the vendor at the end of the contract. So this past year, we had a Microsoft contract that came up. It was a three-year contract, and it came up this past year. The number that came out was extremely high compared to the number that we had had the previous year. We were able to negotiate down about a million and a half dollars, but it still ended up in about a 30% increase. Those are the things that are really hard to project even the, in the operational model, but we're absolutely moving towards that operational <coughs> model rather than the capital expenditure model. Some of the newer big systems, like the integrated eligibility or child welfare systems, um, that aren't necessarily off the shelf, um, it's not as easy to go to an operational model as quickly. But that's that's where we want to end up. So John, t t um, in budget adjustment, uh, <coughs> ADS had asked for $2.3 million for essentially cybersecurity upgrades. Um, $1.8 million of that was funded or is being funded in, in BAA. Uh, and the other $500,000 is what we're talking about here. Um, can you remind me the, the $1.8 that went through BAA, essentially the same stuff um, that we're talking about here in terms of vulnerability assessment and <coughs> hardware related to? Um, you know, kind of access points and servers? All connected. Okay. All connected, um, all living in our network or building our network, part of our network. Okay. We have our firewalls, we have our routers which connect us to the internet, and then we have our switches that connect the computers um, together to the network through the router to the internet. So there's that piece, and then there's the wireless access points, which give us a different way to connect to the network. Rather than a hard wire through the wall, you're now connecting over the air, which connects us to those same switches and routers in the end. So 1.8 in BAA was more firewall oriented, and the other 500 is kind of working deeper into our cybersecurity system. Yep. At the end of the expenditure of that 2.3, let's say by the end of it, fiscal year 20, how will we be doing in terms of our cybersecurity needs? We'll have a pretty strong foundation. Um, finally, I feel like we've been pretty rocky, not knowing what we have, what the, what the assets look like, what the age is. Um, compared to other states, I think we're doing pretty good. I think we'll be doing pretty good. Changes continually. Some states are able to to fund a lot more money for cybersecurity. You know, Georgia built a huge cyber center and spent fifty million dollars. Um, you know, Illinois spent I think thirteen million dollars to to help with uh, some of their security vulnerabilities. Every state's a little bit different, but looking at looking at us as um, size of our state, I think I think we're doing pretty good. We yeah. will be. What I'm trying to get a sense for is, um, and this relates to the prior conversation of you know kind of operating costs. When we will get to a point um, in terms of cybersecurity expenditures where you feel we will have caught up, so that we can more maintain a steady state of expenditure to maintain what we have, um, you know, upgrades as uh, as opposed to. You know, we're kind of in a red flag mode where we are behind, and we've got a, um, you know, we, we've got a spike in expenditures to, you know, to get ourselves to a point where we need to be, even right. to have the rudimentary level of cybersecurity. We yep, we've put. Together, where are we in that cycle? We've put together a five-year plan, mm -hmm. and this is the second year of that five-year plan. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot of work that we're still not doing, um, that I'm not going to go into. Um, 
but our five-year plan addresses those things as far as staffing and contracting and uh, assessments on our network some of those types of things that I feel that um, are still inadequate but our five-year plan addresses those at that point we feel we'll, we'll, we'll be reevaluating at that point it's so hard to say when we're gonna level off the cybersecurity because I don't think if you ask any CIO across the states they're gonna give you a, a firm answer on, sure. on that but we have a five-year plan to to try to get us to where we feel we'll be starting to play. Yep. Good. Um, I would very much like to schedule a meeting where we can go into that. Sure. Um, As an executive yeah. session. Executive session, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd like to follow up. Yeah, I'd love to uh, bring in my new chief information <coughs> security officer to talk about what he sees coming in from the outside, coming from the federal government. He was um, a former CIO for the Coast Guard and has been doing cybersecurity work for the federal government and the different intelligence branches for uh, the past few years. So him coming into the state has a lot of visibility into different things going on out there and has really been an asset to us even in the short time he's been here so far. But he can give you a really good lay of the land as far as where he thinks we are and where he thinks we should be five years from now in, in a more in-depth could we uh, do that like this afternoon from 1 to 6.30? <laughs> 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 How about 4.30 till midnight? No, we're sleeping. Uh, That's rather optimistic of you. Um, at the risk of um, kind of open, opening another vein of, of questioning that we don't have time for, um, are there other things in the ADS budget that you would like to highlight for us at this time? And I will say that as a precursor to um, in the next week or two, we're going to have another conversation um, with regard to integrated eligibility and a recommendation that this committee might make to um, the institutions committee with regard to the budgeting work that they're doing on that. Um, but. I just, you know, we've got a few minutes, and I've, are, there, are there things that you would like to highlight in your world, even beyond um, some of the specific things that the Appropriations Committee is um, asking us to, to opine on that, um, you know, we should, we should flag for future conversations, <coughs> you know, we have with you, uh, whether it be cybersecurity, integrated eligibility, some of the other big projects you're working on um, in terms of how your spending is going for your FY19 budget, you know, any of those things. And we don't have to cover them all now, but right. um, just. I, I think what I would say, and it's not, it's budget related, but yeah. overall, uh, remember, we're, we're an agency that's been in existence for about 20 months. We've, we've pulled together a lot of information and put together a lot of good plans. We've done a lot of good for the enterprise in a very short period of time, but um, my staff um, is continually on the edge of, you know, nervous breakdowns because they're working so hard. They're our, uh, you know, different different areas, they, they're just go, go, go all the time, whether it's our budget office and trying to get new bills out that we've never had to do before. Bill back for every one of our 400 people in different models and meeting federal guidelines. And, and our project management office is now went from six people to 52 people and and is you know wrapping their arms around and building a project portfolio uh, software suite that gives us a dashboard of what we do in state government um, being able to interface and liaison with the different agencies say I know you did that before I know you budgeted and you just went in by yourself but you know it's different now and here's here's how we need to work together all of that type of stuff takes a, takes a while to, to really change the culture and change the way we do things. So I think we've made really good progress, and I could talk, you know, I could keep you guys busy until midnight uh, just talking about the different areas. Would you please? In <laughs> <laughs> our uh, enterprise architecture unit and the, the stuff that we're doing with data and our plans for our data architecture and and uh, the technology that we're using to be able to share 
across agencies that we haven't necessarily been able to do because they've been siloed in separate systems and procurement and how we've inserted new language to um, strengthen you know the responsibilities of the contractors and um, some of the security risk um, that we used to hold now the, the vendors hold so there's a lot of different areas that that we're working in all at once and um, you know my team has been really good about you know putting in a lot of time and you know a lot of heart into making sure that we we move as fast as possible show progress show savings for for everyone but really you know beyond the savings it's it's about making sure that we're doing the right thing long term for our state government mm -hmm. so you know the things that i think pop up on our radar screen excuse me in this committee are um the uh kind of the headline but um the, the headline projects yeah. that ads is overseeing um which we definitely want to give appropriate um uh oversight to you know more broadly um some of the things you talk about in terms of managing what is an agency that you know you're kind of building in real time are there um are there more fundamental um resource management issues that we should be aware of with regard to ads um uh, support um and and I, mean, I know all areas of government are under uh, extreme pressure in terms of um, uh, funding support. You know, where do you stand on that spectrum? I think it goes back to the question on how we want to fund IT <coughs> and how um, and where we want to fund it from. You know, do the agencies own their IT budgets and we work for them implementing what they want to do? Or is it IT gets the pot of money and says, here are our priorities based on risk, based on need? Um, Which one of, the, of the, those is it right now in government? Uh, the agencies have their IT budgets for, for the most part. Mm -hmm. We have uh, some of the shared service stuff, some of the enterprise type stuff, like networking equipment, desktop mm -hmm. support stuff. But the agencies are still dictating what system they're going to stand up next. Okay. Um, and it's, it's when I say dictating it, that's the wrong word to use. It has gotten um, a lot better. I've been here for 18 years in state government, so I've, I've, I've seen this play out over the years, and um, they are decisions that we're making together. But in some cases where I may think a system needs to be replaced, you know, at the end of the day, if, if there's no budget for it, if there's no budget, if, you know, agency X didn't budget for it, my hands are somewhat tied as far as what I can do. So it creates a real challenge as far as, <coughs> I think the system needs to be upgraded. Well, we didn't budget for it. Um, yeah. And it becomes a challenge. And to, to be able to uh, have the visibility across state government to all the agencies and all the departments, especially when we have uh, so much legacy equipment and so many systems that are you know, over 15 years old. It, it becomes a challenge to kind of try to stay in, in those budget conversations and make sure that um, you know, we're, we're pitching as hard as we can, which ones need to be updated and when. Why? Yeah, is there a two-way communication? I mean, do you, it, do you, does ADS tell an agency that, hey, you're going to need to upgrade this uh, piece of hardware or something, uh, or this, <clears throat> yeah, or your software in, you know, the coming year, so make sure you put it in your budget. We estimate it's going to be this much, and put it into your IT budget. <coughs> and do you get good responses from doing that if you do? Sometimes. Yeah. You know, every, everyone's under budget pressure. Right. Um, I think that we, we shine a light on things that have never, you know, had that light shined on them before, like networking equipment, like things that they need in order to operate day to day yeah. that, you know, maybe just got pushed aside because it was, you know, not, they didn't have someone advocating or they didn't have someone saying, you, you really have to do this. This is something that's needed. So some of the some of the bigger projects are a little bit more challenging because you know when you start talking about 
$15 million or $20 million coming out of you know, general fund um, or capital fund, it becomes becomes a little bit more challenging than just the CIO saying, you know, you need to do this. For smaller projects, I, I would think it makes sense for the agencies to own them and to, and to have the responsibility to request their support. Um, larger ones, I don't know. I, th I think it's I think it's moving towards more of a collaborative effort. We have an agency IT leader in every agency. They're part of the senior management team for those agencies. So one of the things that uh, they've been tasked with is, you know, here's your portfolio. Here's everything that you have going on. Here's everything that we're projecting that you want to do. Prioritize it. And at the same time, we're going to prioritize what we feel needs to be done. And we'll come back together and talk about you know how we how we move forward. And I think that's you know that's maturing. Any other questions for John? Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you very much for joining. Thank you. <coughs>